Um, good morning, everyone. Um, today I want to talk briefly about a multi-period landscape in Wiltshire. Um, and there's a nice view of some sheep grazing in Wiltshire fields, looking primarily at relationships between sites in time and space. But I want to frame it in terms of the, the discourse of heritage protection rather than academic investigation, both because that's the context in which the project was developed, and also because I think we can also use the concepts of hierarchy and heterarchy to, um, to deconstruct or rethink some of that discourse. The approach has links, I think, to the work, recent work of Gavin Lucas, who in um, the book Understanding the Archaeological Record, considers the ontological links between archaeologists' practical engagement and our interpretations. Um, basically, he argues that we, you know, we should look for methods and approaches that are commensurate with our interpretations and narratives. But Lucas's argument is developed mainly in terms of excavation and material culture assemblages. So, what if we lift our eyes um, from the um, from the individual sites to the landscape? Um, the issues are similar, I think, but now we also face this key problem of scale. Um, and as Matthew Johnson has noted in, in the ideas of landscape, landscape archaeology tends to produce either syntheses that discard the variation between sites in pursuit of large-scale patterns, or case studies that embrace the detail without inserting it convincingly into a larger narrative. And I think this is where the theme of today's session chimed with me. Um, Crumley's conception of heterarchy in the paper that's cited in the session abstract is directly concerned, among other things, with the issue of scale, um, especially the need for analysis across different scales. Um, but I, I want to turn this slightly again and address not so much the scale of, of academic analysis as how we make uh, how we take the archaeological record and make decisions about significance at a landscape level. And Crumley also discusses the conflation of hierarchy with order, which she argues makes it difficult to imagine or study patterns of relations that are complex but not hierarchical. And this is another theme, I think, that's relevant here. The way that our ordering of the archaeological landscape um, for management purposes, conservation purposes, imposes a kind of hierarchy on the record that may not match what we actually see in um, the archaeological landscape. So the way in which the discourse of heritage protection categorizes and attaches significance to the present historic landscape, which is, I think, a hierarchical process, may not match interpretive readings of past landscapes, which may be organized in, in other ways. Um, the ideas I'm exploring are not necessarily the views of my organization, but um, <laughs> going slightly off piste is what tags for, after all. Um, but it arises from managing a couple of large-scale survey projects and noting a tension between, on one hand, the sort of primary um, organizational remit of identifying sites and monuments and assessing their significance, and on the other, what I see as the necessary context of developing narratives that interpret um, the structure of the landscape in human terms. Um, and that's crucial, I think, to engaging people with heritage, which is also one of Historic England's aims, along with um, what we can see as the more sort of perhaps administrative um, uh, second aim there. Uh, so what do I mean by heritage protection, assessment of significance? Um, protection is often narrowly equated with scheduling, um, scheduled monuments, the statutory designation of sites that are deemed to be of significance, um, either because they're of a rare type or because they're considered to have some kind of special quality. Um, designation involves what I see as a, as a series of hierarchical processes determining what a site is, categorization, how far the area of interest extends, definition, and making the case that it's nationally important, the valuation. So while the, the principles of selection are in theory quite nuanced, essentially the process involves sort of pulling out key sites from 
the, the, the wider archaeological landscape and investing them with special significance. But the idea that we can somehow rank sites as nationally, regionally or locally important, I think, produces another hierarchy that makes, may make little sense in terms of understanding how past landscapes were structured and how they work locally. Um, this uh, slide just shows the, um, the distribution of scheduled monuments around Chippenham in Wiltshire, which is part of the, the project area I'll come on to. Um, and it's uh, not exactly dots on maps, but small red splodges on maps. It tells us very little about the history um, of the landscape. Um, there are, of course, other ways of protecting sites. Simply recording something on a historic environment record means it will be flagged up if planning permission is sought for development in the vicinity. It may also be added to the Natural England database, uh, which makes sites eligible for countryside stewardship. Um, but this, this is some HER um, distribution map for the same area. Um, these still tend to produce a, a sort of atomized view of archaeological landscapes and, again, a sort of hierarchical division rather than articulating relationships between sites. Um, so the, the, sort of the presentation, if you like, of the landscapes of heritage protection are not representative of the ways that those landscapes were inhabited in the past. And as Tom Moore has put it, um, the increasing use of technology, um, GIS, and the development of schemes such as historic landscape characterization <laughs> And this slide shows part of the Wiltshire HLC depicting field morphology, are in danger of emphasizing the importance of quantifying and objectifying landscapes, um, dividing them into types. And such approaches um, may make it difficult to discuss the boundaries between different elements or to recognize more multivocal experience of landscape, um, as Moore puts it. Uh, so why does this matter? Um, protecting selected elements of the present-day historic landscape might not seem particularly relevant to academic narratives of the sort we often discuss at TAG, but I suggest it is something we ought to scrutinise because these decisions are instrumental in planning policy, development control and land management, often determining the nature and locations of our interventions in those historic landscapes. So as always, the nature of our practices can't be entirely separated from the kinds of archaeology we produce. And the big data, which offers the possibility of understanding diversity, um, as we've heard already, may also sort of force us into these classifications and orderings just to, to try and make sense of it all. Um, so this kind of big picture stuff needs to be tempered, of course, through confrontations with the, the detail. Um, it's also important, I think, because there are other issues that I don't have time to, to go into, um, including sort of setting of monuments. We all know about the old Oswestry debate, um, the question of how we assess what is nationally important, um, which is the subject of recent reports commissioned by Historic England. So I'm not saying that you know, the wrong sites are designated and protected, just that you know, there's more to it than that. And we need to present archaeological landscapes not simply as collections of discrete sites assigned different levels of significance in some kind of hierarchy, but in more holistic and relational terms. And often, as I'll try and show, I think the key locations for understanding will not necessarily be the ones with the red lines drawn around them on the map. And I think this, this kind of approach chimes with, with you know, recent theoretical approaches which are moving away from the analysis of bounded entities and categories to seeing the social as emergent from networks and relationships. How such understanding can be brought into a, a heritage management sphere is a, is a tricky question, but a, a, I think it's one that we ought to consider. And one point of contact could be the, um, the European Landscape Convention, which does resist these hierarchical definitions. Landscape is not seen as neutral, but it's a matter of perception. It's not pre-given, but it arises from interaction. So the ELC places great emphasis on ordinary meanings given to ordinary places by ordinary people. Um, and I think perhaps that offers us a way in uh, to looking at, looking at landscapes and management terms slightly differently. So let's return to, for the second part of the, the talk, the landscape that I showed a bit of earlier. This was an area of West Wiltshire, which was the setting for um, the 
snappily titled National Archaeological <laughs> Identification Survey Project, one of a, a small series of these. The name only really matters to the extent that it, it foregrounds um, identification leading to that tension that I, I, I talked about um, earlier. Um, so here's the area, we can see the key settlements um, in that project area and the slightly odd shape is designed to sort of take in the, um, the A350 road corridor and the, and the River Avon. Um, in practical terms, a key innovation for this project doesn't seem like rocket science, but uh, at, at Historic England or English Heritage as it was, it was something a bit different, was to actually get people working together. Um, and that having a combination of different perspectives on the landscape, I think inevitably leads to thinking about how we make sense of it as a whole, not just this identification of sites. So the, the project allowed us to develop a dialogue between different techniques, but there remain hierarchies in the methodologies that, that we apply, and these often relate to scale. Um, the dominance of the aerial mapping, for example, um, is related to the sort of vastly greater area that it, it can cover. And you can see the sort of proportions of the project area we were able to cover with um, a geophysical survey and, and excavation. Um, the, uh, the screen isn't really, isn't really showing very clearly um, the sort of features, and, and I can't move from here to point anything out. <laughs> um, so I will just. Uh, We'll have to uh, go through some of these locations and if you really want to know exactly where everything is, then we can talk a bit later. Um, but the project area covers this part of the Avon Valley. I think the key point about this landscape is that it's not that well known because it lies between the better known landscapes of the Wiltshire Downs to the east and southeast and the Cotswolds to the west and the northwest. Um, in many periods, it seems to be rather sort of ordinary landscape and seems like a good area, therefore, to explore some of these issues of diversity and heterarchy, um, especially looking sort of beyond what we normally take as sort of significant sites. Um, and at the end, I'll just briefly consider how we might take this kind of data and knowledge into the sort of heritage protection sphere. Um, so I'll see how far I get through some of these before I have to shut up and let you all go for coffee. Um, hierarchical relationships, it's very easy to sort of look at this part of the, of the landscape where we have a, a Roman small town, which is sort of shaded in, in yellow in the center there, um, on a, a, an east-west Roman road, which you can see on slightly different alignments either side of the, the slide. Um, there's a villa complex to the north, there's various interesting looking enclosures. This is a kind of sort of classic area where you, you think you'd want to go and um, um, invest, you know, schedule intra, you know, the key sites and investigate the, the sort of hierarchy of the, the Roman landscape. But uh, across the wider project area, I think there are many other patterns, especially interesting relationships of similarity and difference between um, a number of small sub-rectangular enclosures that, that seem to characterize this area in the late Iron Age Romano-British um, period. And um, on the, uh, at, at, here's a close-up at, at, at the bottom of part of this area, and that sort of green um, double-ditched enclosure, crop mark enclosure um, on the right, um, is sort of part of this um, the hierarchical looking landscape, if you like, around the, the Roman town, but much further away um, in another part of, of the project area, in a sort of very differently ordered landscape, we have an almost sort of identical um, in terms of size, shape, orientation, um, we have an almost identical enclosure. Um, so we've got different, um, we've got very similar sites playing roles in, in rather different Landscape, so you know we shouldn't make assumptions. I think about what these mean, um, and this pattern. Again, it's not it's not particularly clear, but what we've got is a, a sort of series of regularly spaced enclosures, um, and often there, there there seems to be a pair between a, a more complex one and a less complex one, kind of spaced um, 
along the, the, the edge of the, of the limestone here west of, of Chippenham. Um, so is, is this kind of spatial pattern, as opposed to the, the sort of concentric arrangement around the Belucchio settlement, is this kind of spatial pattern a sign of an organized landscape? Um, is, it, is that organization imposed from above, or is this um, a sort of flat, um, egalitarian um, approach where we have a series of, of farmsteads, um, enclosures of, of very similar status? Um, all this, of course, happening a, quite a long a way away from the, the major Roman road. And when we did investigate some of these um, rectangular enclosures, we find that similar sites have, have different histories. Um, so here at, uh, at Paxcroft, um, geophysics added much more detail to the aerial map. We have a small <coughs> enclosed farmstead that originates in the late Iron Age, continues until the later second century AD. There's a field system, there's a period of um, reorganization of the settlement and, and fields, and it's parked in a busy landscape um, with a number of earlier enclosures going back at least to the, the early Iron Age. Um, in contrast, here at, um, at Kellaways, uh, to the northeast of Chippenham, the, um, the pottery assemblage um, is entirely in the Roman period. It's a brief period of occupation spanning the later first into the second century AD. There's a lack of apparent structures in this enclosure, but we do see evidence for substantial and repeated serial processing. So perhaps some kind of temporary or seasonal agricultural site has, has been suggested. So the similarity in this, unlike sort of Chad's extremely difficult to classify enclosures, we've actually seen a sort of series of enclosures which appear quite regular they often have, as you can see in the, the aerial photograph on the right, this square form or sub-square form and a, a sort of a, a, a small part of the, of the enclosure separated off by some kind of internal subdivision. But when you go in and look at them, um, they're very diverse in, in the way they've been used. There's also this uh, crop mark field system um, and if you look on the, the right hand side, the lower right, you can see one of the sort of boundaries of this field system um, runs across a couple of small ring ditches. So here we have a sort of later prehistoric or Romano British field system laid out over two small, um, presumably early Bronze Age um, barrows or ring ditches. So that these are, here's the sort of history of the landscape being incorporated and and inserted, um, but you know, is this something that's designed to respect the earlier monuments or to remove them? Um, again, there's the, the we can look at this in look at this landscape in different ways, and there's time depth here too. At the top, there's a, a sort of curvilinear enclosure which seems to have been <coughs> incorporated into the landscape, and at, at the bottom, there's a one of these rectangular enclosures with a kind of long straight. Um, rather imposing driveway uh, up to it, which um, appears to have been kind of in, uh, inserted into the, the field system. So this is not a, a sort of static division of land, it's sort of changing over time, incorporating things as it goes. Um, and we can think about the social processes in, involved in, in producing that. Um, Again, looking at slightly earlier periods, we've got uh, a Barrow Cemetery um, on the right, um, the, the, the sort of largest in the, the project area. But actually, I think the, what's interesting about the Bronze Age landscape is that we've actually got these sort of small, quite regularly spaced individual um, ring ditches, but they often seem to come in pairs, and it's hard to see at, at this scale. But uh, we often have these kind of paired ring ditches and uh, uh, that phenomenon kind of seems more interesting if you like than um, what passes uh, best in this area of Wiltshire for a sort of classic Barrow Cemetery. Um, I'm going to pass over the Neolithic 
Um, I'm just going <laughs> to wait. That goes against uh, <laughs> my uh, my nature, I have to say. But never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, looking at the at, at the post-Roman landscape, we see the line of the Roman road enshrined in later parish boundaries and field systems. We seem to have early medieval field systems attached to it. But here is a, what was a major routeway in one period being transformed, um, as it endures into the later landscape, into a boundary and. Um, we can kind of see the distribution of ridge and furrow, the sort of big purple and, and grey splodges, different phases of ridge, ridge and furrow earthworks, and that big kind of block in the sort of bottom third of the, the project area runs up to the Roman road and then stops. So we have, have a different post-medieval landscape either side of this boundary. And the other thing I don't have time to discuss is actually the archaeology of cheese. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but there's a really interesting story about kind of display and inequality, I think, in the post-medieval landscape. How to draw these connections and relationships into the data sets that are used for our sort of planning and protection decisions. I think the role of research frameworks is important here. We tend to establish significance as something for all time. Sites don't usually stop being scheduled unless they've been damaged or removed. But what if we saw significance as more contextual and nuanced, you know, a, a heterarchical process rather than a, a hierarchical one, um, and actually uh, looked at what we wanted to protect and, in the, the, and investigate in terms of uh, um, current and changing research priorities. So if we made judgments about, based on, on sort of research value, if you like, however that's defined, rather than uh, something like national importance, which always seems a bit spurious to me, then we could perhaps create a system which made contextual decisions about the value of interventions or protection efforts on particular sites at particular times, and perhaps could better articulate local character and place. And I'll leave it there, thanks.